Hey there, Orioles fans. Today is Wednesday, May 11th, 2022, and welcome back in to the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, I'm your host, Connor Newcomb, and coming up on today's episode, we recap another Orioles victory, and this one was a whole lot of fun as they beat the St. Louis Cardinals 5-3 to on Tuesday night in Game 1 of a three-game set. Kyle Bradish was magnificent. 11 strikeouts and 7 innings of strong work, and the Orioles take Game 1. I'll give you the five things you need to know from that one. Then, a little history lesson here on the podcast, because the Orioles started a series in St. Louis on Tuesday night for the first time since 2003, and it was their first trip ever to the new Bush Stadium, which was built in 2006. So we'll take a look back at 2003, the only other time the Orioles have played in St. Louis and what that series looked like and what the team looked like back then, a little uh, trip down memory lane here on today's episode. But that's all coming up on today's episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast. You are Locked On Orioles, your daily Baltimore Orioles podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. So on today's episode, we got to start with what was another just incredibly fun Orioles win. And as we get to that today, this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is brought to you by Blue Nile.com. And really just a, a great place to go and find that perfect piece of jewelry for someone special in your life. Again, that is BlueNile.com. And before we get to the episode, just want to thank you, the listener, for making Locked on Orioles your first listen of the day. You know the spiel. You know, if you listen on any platform, leave a rating and a review. It really helps. We're here Monday through Friday every week during the regular season. We're here on YouTube as well. Make sure to like, comment, subscribe to the YouTube page, Locked on Orioles. But specifically, wanted to thank you because, you know, we get a weekly reports. Uh, from just listenership across the network here on the Locked On Podcast Network every week. And the report that we got on Monday here, the first time ever in the history of Locked On Orioles, I've been hosting this podcast since January of 2020, first time ever that this podcast was in the top 10 listenership among all Locked On MLB podcasts. Yeah, the Orioles might be a bottom 10 team in the league, but we've got a top 10 listenership, and that is all thanks to you guys. Thank you so much for tuning into the pod and making Locked On Orioles your first listen of the day. And for your first listen today, Orioles 5, Cardinals 3. The O's have now won 7 of their last 10 games, and boy, was it fun to see the O's take Game 1 of the three-game set in St. Louis on Tuesday night. And let's start with the five things you need to know from that one. And of course, where else can you start than with Kyle Bradish, who absolutely dominated, dominated the St. Louis Cardinals on Tuesday night. In his third career start, Bradish's final line, seven innings, two runs allowed on four hits, 11 strikeouts, no walks, and one two-run inside-the-park home run that he allowed In the sixth inning, that was the only runs he gave up on the day as Harrison Bader got himself a two-run inside the park home run. Bradish allowed only six hard-hit balls. He threw 90 pitches and has a 4-2-4 ERA through his first three starts. And really, just incredible stuff from Kyle Bradish. He is just the second pitcher in Major League history to have 11 strikeouts, and no walks in one of his first three career starts. The only other pitcher to do that, Steven Strasburg. And uh, I know Strasburg's had a little bit of injury issues lately, but I would say Strasburg went on to have a pretty, pretty good Major League Baseball career. He's also only the second Orioles starter to have 11 strikeouts in his rookie season in one of his first five starts and uh, or one of his first three starts to have just 11 strikeouts. Doesn't matter the amount of walks. Jimmy Haynes was the other one in 1995. Not as cool of a stat, but still interesting that an Orioles starter hasn't done it since 1995. And the first Orioles starter to have double digit strikeouts as a rookie since Wei in Chen did it a couple of times back in 2012. Kyle Bradis was just 
unbelievable on Tuesday night. Let's break down what made him so good. First of all, he threw 90 pitches. We know he has four pitches, but he was basically a four-pitch pitcher, or I should say, he was basically a two-pitch pitcher on Tuesday night. Of his 90 pitches, it was 43 fastballs, 32 sliders, and then he threw eight change-ups and seven curveballs. So, yeah, he tossed them in there from time to time, but the pitch was the fastball and the slider, and those things were dominant. About 48% fastballs, he averaged 95.3 miles per hour, which is up a whole mile per hour from his year-long average so far, and he hit 98 with one of his pitches, topped out at 98 on the fastball. That was the hardest pitch that he has thrown all season. He got five whiffs on his fastball. He was in the strike zone all day, getting a lot of strikes with that pitch, 42% CSW. It was fantastic. But the slider, my goodness, the Kyle Bradish slider. He had nine whiffs on that pitch for a total of 14 whiffs on the night in his 90 pitches. Nine whiffs on the slider on 20 swings, also seven foul balls. He got five called strikes with that pitch, 44% CSW, threw it 36% of the time. Thing was unhittable. I mean, the best AB I saw was against Nolan Arenado early in the game. There was a slider on the outside corner for a called strike one. Then gets a swing and a miss on a slider down and away. Then another swing and a miss on a slider down and away for a three-pitch strikeout with three sliders to Nolan Arenado, who was named National League Player of the Month for the month of April. He has been dominant at the plate this season. And Kyle Bradish just made him look like he was a replacement-level hitter, basically, at the plate. I mean, Bradish was ridiculous on the night. And I got to say, the thing that impressed me most out of Bradish was what happened in the sixth inning. So he's through five scoreless. His pitch count was right around 60. He was dominating. He comes back out in the sixth and he's got the bottom of the order. Seven, eight, nine, Melina Bader and Brendan Donovan were due up in the sixth inning. You're thinking, all right, he's going to cruise to the bottom of the order, get through six. His day will be done. It'll be great. He goes ahead 0 and 2 on Yadier Molina. And he just leaves a fastball down the middle on 0-2. Too much of the plate. Molina socks it into right center field for a leadoff double. So he regathers himself. He gets ahead of 0-2 on Harrison Bader. Hangs a slider right down the middle. Bader jumps on it. May have been a curveball, actually. Jumps on it into left center field. Took a weird bounce off the wall. Cedric Mullins just missed getting to it. It kicks away into left field. And Bader ends up getting a two-run inside the park home run. Electrifies the crowd. Gets... St. Louis kind of back into the game, making it five to two at that point in the sixth inning. You're thinking, oh no, you know, top of the lineup is about to come up. He just hung two oh two pitches. Maybe the wheels fall off. Because remember, we saw the wheels fall off for Bradish in his last start Wednesday night. I was in the ballpark against the Twins. He threw three scoreless innings to start the game, looked really good, and then gave up four innings or four runs in the fourth and just got clobbered in that fourth inning by the Minnesota offense. You know, we gave up a couple hits and then everything fell apart. This time, it was different. He locked down, he strikes out Donovan, he strikes out Tommy Edmond, and he strikes out Paul Goldschmidt one, two, three after that to strike out the side and finish the inning. And I thought, hey, he's going to end it on a high note. Great job. No, no, no. He was back out for more to retire Arenado, Juan Yepes, and Tyler O'Neill in the seventh inning to get through seven. It was just ridiculous what we saw from Kyle Bradish today. Fastball and slider were just at a different level. Man. If this, you know, I saw a good tweet about this, forget it, apologize to whoever tweeted it, forget who I saw it from, but if this is the Orioles' third best pitching prospect, this team's going to be really good. And he is, with obviously Grayson Rodriguez and D.L. Hall ahead of him. Man, that was fun to watch. Second thing you need to know is that the Oriole offense showed up in this one as well. They had five runs on 11 hits, and the leader was Cedric Mullins. How about a four-hit day for Cedric, his first of the season, as he goes four for five, had a two-run homer to open the scoring back in the third inning off of Cardinals starter Packy Naughton, and that ball was crushed. I mean, that ball was crushed back in the third inning for Cedric Mullins. Um, he just clobbered a ball lefty-lefty, and it's been so cool to see him continue to hit lefty-lefty since he's become a full-time left-handed hitter. 101 miles per hour off the bat, 404 feet. That ball traveled to right field for a two-run homer. Ended up with three other singles on the day and, you know, didn't crush the ball every other time 
he was at the dish, but you know, did end the day with two hard hit balls, had the home run, and a four for five also stole a base. Big day for Cedric at the plate. Third thing you need to know, Tyler Nevin hit his first home run of the season, second of his career. Of course, he had one in that final series of the year in Toronto when he came up late in 2021. But Nevin, it was only hit of the day, one for four, and it was only a solo homer. And he also struck out twice in this game. And, you know, he's still only hitting 167 on the year, but he had two hard hit balls, including that home run, which was smashed. The, uh, you know, account that tells you, you know, how many ballparks, you know, a home run would, would be a home run in, said it was a true dinger. Would have been a home run in all 30 ballparks off the bat of Tyler Nevin as he hit that solo home run. And, I mean, completely crushed that ball out to left center field into the Oriole bullpen. And, you know, 103 miles per hour off the bat, 397 feet, a solo shot. Put a good swing on it. I love Tyler Nevin. I like his versatility. We've seen some bad outfield defense, but some good defense at third base, and I just like what he can bring to the Orioles. Fourth thing you need to know is really the one probably negative thing from this win for the O's. Dylan Tate was a disaster in the ninth inning. Of course, Kyle Bradish left after eight. Joey Crable, uh, nicely done, had a scoreless eighth inning to keep it at five to two. Kyle Bradish leaving after seven. Crable with the scoreless eighth. And then the Orioles go to Dylan Tate, who... You know, they called on to get the save in game two of the doubleheader on Sunday after Jorge Lopez had pitched game one. Well, Lopez pitched again on Monday. We said he wasn't going to be available. And then, you know, some unfortunate news for Jorge Lopez. He was placed on the bereavement list before Tuesday's game. It turns out he lost his grandfather. Uh, we, we wish all the best to Jorge and his family. But, you know, with Lopez not with the team, they recalled Travis Lakins to take his spot. And, you know, Lopez wasn't going to be available tonight either way, but the Orioles didn't have their closer. And like they did Sunday, they turned to Dylan Tate as option number two. It did not go well. He did get two outs of the three he needed, but he allowed a leadoff homer to the nine batter. Brendan Donovan allowed another hard hit ball for base hit. Um, no walks, but no strikeouts. And he got, I mean, he got hit hard. I mean, it was only two hard hit balls, but even the two outs were pretty re well struck in the left field and right field. Santander and Austin Hayes each had to make nice running catches to get the two outs for Dylan Tate. And uh, then he hit a batter as well, had a fastball get way away from him, hit Juan Yepes, who actually left the game after getting hit by that pitch. And he thought, oh no, it's 5-3. There's two on, two outs. And in steps, big Felix Bautista. Looking for his first career save, and what do they say? You know, one man's trash is another man's treasure. Dylan Tate's trash outing was a treasure for Felix Bautista. He comes into the game facing Tyler O'Neill. He goes fastball at 99 for a called strike, fastball at 100 for strike two. Then he goes fastball 102 that misses up and out for a ball. Fastball is fouled off. And then he goes to the splitter just ties O'Neal up in knots, down and in for a swing and a miss in strike three to win the game for the Orioles. Bautista with his first career save for the 5-3 victory. And it was only one batter, but you could see him coming in knowing that he may only have to face one batter. He threw even harder, and he once again threw his hardest pitch of the season. That fastball that missed up and away clocked in at 101.9 miles per hour per stat cast. His fastball was consistently at 100 obviously only threw four fastballs but you know one of them was 99 the other three were 100 or above it was fun to watch and then that pitch he threw the splitter was ridiculous to get the swing and miss oh yeah the O's have some nasty stuff in their pitching rotation and the Orioles win it Kyle Bradish leading the charge they win it five to three but of course the fifth thing fifth and final thing you need to know is that Ramon Urias was actually scratched from this game, was initially in the starting lineup for the Orioles, but was scratched, and Chris Owings replaced him in the nine-hole playing second base. Owings actually did have a double in this game. He also popped up a bunt with runners on first and second that turned into a double play and a disaster, but uh, no word on Ramon Arias as I record this right around 11 p.m. Eastern time on Tuesday night. We'll obviously keep you updated if we get any news on Urias. But uh, yeah, he was scratched, so hopefully not an injury issue for him 
and the Orioles. But either way, the O's win the game, 5-3. to three. And again, they have won seven of their last 10 games. They take game one of the series. And with the victory, Orioles now 13-17 and 17 through 30 games on the season. But it was the O's in St. Louis on Tuesday night, something we haven't seen a whole lot of. In fact, only one series previously in the history of the Baltimore Orioles since 1954 have they played in St. Louis. It came in 2003 when the O's dropped two of three to the Cardinals at a different ballpark than the one they play in now. So I wanted to take a look back at that 2003 series and the 2003 Orioles just to get a little perspective on how long it's been since the O's played in St. Louis. And we'll get to that coming up right after this. But first, let's talk about LinkedIn. Now, you may know it as the place where you maybe go to find a job, but with spring in the air, it's a time of renewal and growth, personally and professionally. As your small business grows, LinkedIn Jobs is here to make it easier to find the people you want to talk to faster and for free. I've used LinkedIn a lot in my life, and it is super helpful to find any kind of job. Also, it's great on the other end when you're looking for candidates and you're posting your job. You can create a free job post in minutes on LinkedIn Jobs to reach your network and beyond the world's largest professional network of over 810 million people. That's a lot of millions of people that could fill the position you're looking to hire. It's got simple tools like screening questions that make it easy to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience so you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and who you'd like to hire. And LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the candidates you want to talk to faster. Did you know every week, nearly 40 million job seekers, including myself, visit LinkedIn. So post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on MLB. That's linkedin.com slash locked on MLB to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. So the Orioles beat the Cardinals 5-3 to three on Tuesday night to take game one of a three-game series, but this is not something Orioles fans have been used to much at all, watching baseball in St. Louis at Busch Stadium. In fact, the newest version of Busch Stadium, which was built in 2006, this was the Orioles' first ever trip to that ballpark. It was built 16 years ago. Somehow, with the schedules and the interleague play, the Orioles just were never sent there. In fact, since the O's became the Orioles in 1954, they have only played in St. Louis one other time. It was June 6th through the 8th of 2003 when the O's went there and the Cardinals took two out of three in a three-game series. And I get it. The O's had been in St. Louis much before, if you don't count the Orioles, but you count the St. Louis Browns, the franchise that became the Baltimore Orioles in 1954. I get it. This franchise used to be in St. Louis. But since playing or since becoming the Orioles, they basically haven't gone back to St. Louis at all. It's just been weird scheduling, but they finally get to go back this week. So I wanted to take a couple minutes here to just kind of look back at that series and look back at the 2003 Orioles. Get a little perspective here. June 6th through the 8th of 2003, the only other Orioles visit to St. Louis. It was version two of Bush Stadium. Not even the current one. We saw the Orioles win in on Tuesday night. So first of all, let's take a look at this series. You know, the Orioles ended up dropping two out of three in this series. They were already a losing team at that point. Uh, you know, we'll get to the Orioles won 71 games in 2003, but we'll start with game one. And uh, the Cardinals won that one eight to six. And uh, Albert Pujols, you may have heard of him uh, because he is still on the Cardinals. Well, back for a second round here in 2022. But uh, he had a three RBI double off of Jorge Julio. Remember him from the Orioles in the eighth inning that uh, put the Cardinals up eight to six and helped them win that game. The Orioles starting pitcher in game one was a man named Rick Helling, who I had never heard of before doing this research for this podcast. Rick Helling threw four innings, allowed five runs on seven hits with three Ks and three walks. Rick Helling played one season for the Orioles. 2003, he made 24 starts. He had a 5.74 ERA. The Orioles released him in August. He then signed with the Florida Marlins had a .5 ERA in 11 relief appearances down the stretch for the Marlins in 2003, made their postseason roster, and oh yeah, helped the Marlins win a World Series in 2003. So shout out to Rick Helling for getting that World Series ring, but uh, I had legitimately never heard of the man. But uh, that is who started Game 1 the last time the Orioles were in St. Louis. Game 2, well that was the Oriole victory. 
The O's won the game 8-1. to one. Davey Cruz had two home runs in the game, and he actually had maybe the best three-game series of his career, or at least the best three-game series as an Oriole. He was only an Oriole in 2003. Cruz went 8-for-13 with three doubles, three homers, and seven RBIs in the three-game series. He clearly liked playing in St. Louis. But the Orioles, you know, got good offense. Also won the game because everyone's favorite Oriole, tongue-in-cheek, Sidney Ponson threw a complete game, one of his four complete games that season, nine innings, eight strikeouts, just one run allowed as the Orioles beat St. Louis in game two. And then game three, a wild baseball game in which St. Louis won it 11 to 10 to win the series. Scott Rowland hit a grand slam in the sixth inning off of Rick Bauer to give the Cardinals the lead. And really what I wanted to do here is just read off the lineups from that game three, the last time the Orioles played in St. Louis before Tuesday night. Here is your Cardinals lineup with Matt Morris on the hill. Didn't know who that was. Miguel Cairo leading off playing second. J.D. Drew is in right field hitting second. Albert Pujols is hitting third and playing left field. You can't imagine that now. Jim Edmonds in center hitting fourth. Scott Rowland playing third base hitting fifth. Edgar Renteria at short hitting sixth. Tino Martinez at first base hitting seventh. And Mike Matheny, the manager of the Royals now, who the O's just took two of three from over the weekend, was catching hitting eighth. And of course, Matt Morris, the starting pitcher, batting ninth. Your Orioles lineup for the last time they played in St. Louis before last night. Brian Roberts leading off playing second. Luis Matos in center field hitting second. Melvin Mora in left field hitting third. Jeff Conine at first base hitting fourth. Jay Gibbons in right field hitting fifth. Tony Batista playing third base with that crazy batting stance hitting sixth. The man of the hour that day, Davey Cruz, played shortstop and hit seventh. Brooke Fordyce was the catcher hitting eighth. And Jason Johnson was the Orioles starting pitcher batting ninth. What a trip down memory lane that is for the Orioles. But you know, it wasn't just about that series. We're throwing it back to 2003. I wanted to take a closer look at that 2003 Orioles season because, yes, it was just one of those seasons in the 15-year stretch, 98 to 2011, where the Orioles had losing years. But I want to take a look at kind of who stood out, who did what on that 2003 team coming up here in just a second. But first... Let's talk about Built Bar, because if we go back to 2003, you probably wished you had some Built Bars to watch the Orioles, because you need a little more enjoyment out of your snacks while you were sitting down to watch the O's lose 91 games in 2003. But now you do have Built Bars, and not only that, the Orioles are winning some baseball games now, so you can enjoy a Built Bar, and you can enjoy some Orioles baseball. Of course, the Built Bar is the best tasting protein bar on the market. Why? Because it tastes just like a candy bar. It is the most delicious protein bar on the market. All the bars covered in 100% real chocolate, all the bars with 17 grams of protein. They got these great flavors like peanut butter brownie, mint chocolate. They got fruit flavors like cherry and others. They're delicious. They give you the, the, the energy you need. They give you the great taste you need. It's like, again, eating a candy bar. You keep thinking Built Bar can't keep getting away with this, and they continue to do it with these delicious protein bars. So if you want to get your hands on some Built Bars or any of their other products, head to Built.com, and if you use the promo code LOCKED15, you'll get 15% off your order. Again, that is promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at Built.com. So the Orioles beat the Cardinals on Tuesday night, 5-3. to three, First time in St. Louis since 2003. And we talked about what the O's and the Cardinals did in that last series in June of 2003. But wanted to finish off the pod today just taking a look back at the 2003 Orioles. That last group of 25 to travel to St. Louis to play the Cardinals. First of all, that team went 71-91-1, finishing in fourth place in the AL East. They had a winning record through April and then things just kind of fell apart, as they seem to do for that area of Orioles teams. But Mike Hargrove was the manager. Mike Flanagan was the GM that year. And 2003, probably most famous for opening day. You know, it was good for one day of the season. That was, of course, the famous snow game where the Orioles hit the walk-off in the 13th inning, playing through the snow early in the game in 2003. That's what that season is known for. But you go through the rest of the year, things didn't really go great. But wanted to just take a look at kind of who, who led that team. So 
Let's start with kind of the leaders stats wise. Your war leader, and I'll, I'll give you a second to play some trivia in your head if you're listening at home, watching at home, figure out who this might have been. But the war leader was Melvin Mora, 4.7 war according to baseball reference. He had kind of his breakout year with the Orioles in 2003. He was fantastic at the plate and in the field that year. Of course, he led the team in batting average as well at 317. Your leader in Orioles homers was Tony Batista with the fantastic wide open stance, hit 26 bombs that year. Or your leader in doubles, the Rule 5 pick legend, Jay Gibbons with 39 doubles. He also led the team in RBIs. He was the only guy to hit 100. He had exactly 100 runs batted in in 2003. And then your Oriole leader in stolen bases, this one a little bit easier. It is, of course, Brian Roberts, who stole 23 bags for the O's in 2003. Well, the offense was okay. It was so-so. It was up and down. The pitching staff, well, it followed the pattern of a lot of pitching staffs in the mid-2000s. Not good for the Orioles. Your innings pitch leader was the aforementioned Jason Johnson, who started the final game of that series in St. Louis. He threw 189 and two-thirds innings for the Orioles. Your ERA leader overall was B.J. Ryan, who had a really great year as the Orioles' setup man, but he had a 3.40 ERA. That was the best ERA. I get it was steroid era. ERAs were up, but still, 3.40. You usually need a pitcher with a better ERA than that. And your saves leader, another guy we mentioned, Jorge Julio had 36 saves that year for the Orioles. Now, if you want to know what the O's pitching staff looked like, there was eight different pitchers who made at least nine starts for the Orioles this season. Some of these names are going to take you back, and some of these names you're going to go, who? Because that's what I did as well. Jason Johnson, Pat Henchin, Sidney Ponson, Rodrigo Lopez. He was good. Rodrigo Lopez was very good. Rick Helling, who I mentioned earlier. Omar Dahl, Eric Dubose, and Damian Moss were your eight Orioles pitchers to start at least nine games. Again, 71, 91, and one. Not exactly a great year in Birdland. But, you know, those 15 seasons were most of my early life as an Orioles fan. Frankly, I wasn't even kind of aware of the Orioles in 2003, you know, dating my age. I was five years old throughout that season. My kind of first memory of the Orioles is around 2005. So there's some of these guys I don't even remember watching playing back then. Obviously, the guys like Mora. And, and Gibbons and B.J. Ryan and, and Jorge Julio, I, I saw later on, Ponson as well. But yeah, it was some darker days. And it kind of does put in perspective the current Orioles going to St. Louis because, yeah, maybe you know we count it as somewhat successful. If the Orioles win 71 games this year, I'm pretty pleased with that after winning what feels like none, but actually 52 you know, last year. If they do a 19-game improvement, that's great. But the way they go at it, the Orioles had some veterans, had some solid pieces, but just no pitching and things fell apart. If the O's can win 71 games this year, building things up with guys like what we saw from Kyle Bradish on Tuesday night, I would uh, I would definitely take that as a much more positive spin in getting out of this rebuild. But that'll do it for today. Do have an update here right at the end of the pod on Ramon Urias. Mentioned that he was scratched late from the Orioles lineup on Tuesday. Brandon Hyde said after the game that Ramon Urias had some discomfort in his abdomen during batting practice. They're going to check on him here on Wednesday to get a further update. So that's what we know currently on Ramon Urias. But speaking of Wednesday, we'll be back with you here on the pod for another episode. Just did want to give an update. Uh, I will be out of town uh, Thursday through Sunday. Uh, one of my best friends, bachelor party weekends should be fun. Uh, but I will still have podcasts for you on Thursday, on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday this week. But the Thursday-Friday episodes coming up after this one, we will not have game recaps in those episodes. So I will not be recapping game two or three of this St. Louis Cardinals series. Uh, we will have interviews banked for the next two episodes. On tomorrow's episode, Andy Koska is joining us, one of the new Orioles beat writers for the Baltimore Sun. He was in Norfolk on Tuesday night watching D.L. Hall be pretty impressive in his AAA debut. We'll talk to Andy about that. And we'll talk to Andy about the Orioles offense seemingly waking up here in the month of May and helping them play some much better baseball. That's coming up on tomorrow's episode. And then on Friday, we'll do a preview of the Orioles Tigers series happening in Detroit. Scott Bentley, the host of Locked on Tigers, will join us for a crossover episode to take a look at why 
We thought Detroit would be a year ahead of the Orioles in the rebuild and would really be playing well this year, but why that hasn't been the case so much so far for Detroit in 2022. But again, first, we're back tomorrow with Andy Koska of the Baltimore Sun. But until then, I'm Connor Newcomb, and this has been the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.